this way? Right. Well, good evening, Cornerstone North. Amen. Great to see you guys. Amen. Glad that God let you guys be here today for a beautiful service. Uh, just giving announcements for the calendar. So Mondays we have Bible reading, Bible study with Brother Victor. On Mondays at 7.30 p.m. It's about an hour long. And then Tuesdays we have Bible studies with Pastor Jesse Gamboa. And then Wednesdays, we have Bible reading, 4 p.m. with Brother Miguel. You can contact him for any information. Thursday, we have women's Bible reading at 12.30. You can contact Sister Crystal. This, you right? Either of the crystals. Uh, <laughs> and then Friday, we have celebrating deliverance with uh, Brother Richard. And then this coming Saturday, Men one of War? Was men, when's Men of War? Um, next week? Okay. I think this coming week or uh, something. Else, but I just want to read a psalm to you guys. Psalm 115 and 11. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord's been speaking to me lately a lot about just trusting in him. And you know we can get overwhelmed and burdened with all the little things we have in our life, and it's always a, a why me in our flesh, but in the spirit it should be a thank you because that means the Lord is making way for us. He's trying to help us grow. That means the devil hates us, and we should love that the devil hates us because that means more glory to God. So we just start the service off with prayer. So can we all stand and pray? Uh, hallelujah. Can we just worship God real quick? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Father God, hallelujah. You are not a mistake, Lord Jesus. You are the God of the universe, Lord Jesus. May you touch all my brothers and sisters' hearts, Lord Jesus, in the service. For you know all the needs, all the things that we've been hurting through, the, through these tough seasons, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. As a church, as a body, as a unity, Lord Jesus. But you are a great God, a great Father, Lord Jesus. And your love endures forever, Lord Jesus, as it says in one of the Psalms, hallelujah, Jesus. May you really coat us, Lord Jesus, in your perfection. May you really forgive us and bring us to our knees to repent to our sins and do a complete 180, not a 179, not a 181, Lord Jesus, but a 180 going in your direction, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. May you really touch on our hearts, Father God. May you bring our families, Lord Jesus, to the house of God, to the truth, to the real doctrine, Lord Jesus. May your voice be heard. May you cleanse our ears, Lord Jesus. May you purify our hearts. May you bring, bring us soundness, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. May you praise you through the storm, Lord Jesus, and not really, not, may we not cry about the things that we go through, Lord Jesus, but may we praise you through the storm, hallelujah, Jesus, because you deserve everything. We don't deserve anything, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. You are a king to be worshipped, Lord Jesus, not seen as a friend or just as some guy, Lord Jesus, but you are a king. You are the God of the universe, Lord Jesus. Your anointing is real. May people really get into the truth, really get into their prayer life, Lord Jesus, really get into your soundness, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. And may your glory endure forever, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Please, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on. Somebody clap your hands to Jesus. Hallelujah. The King is in the house. Would you join us as Sister Amy leads us in worship? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Isn't it so good to be back in the house of the Lord? I love being here, Jesus, Lord. Let your presence come into this place, God. Let us all just lift our hands to him. Let's bring down heaven in this place, Jesus, Lord. We worship you, God. You are our Father, Jesus, Lord, and we worship you and we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. My, that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. For oh, his love for me, who the Lord sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs. While I was a slave to sin, he died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Lord sets free, 
praise and treasure that fade are never enough. Then you came along. Can you put me back together? And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, love. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. If you believe that nothing's better than him, just worship him. Oh, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you call me friend. Oh, because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, love. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. that nothing is better than him you ought to just lift your hands to him and thank him that you're here today Jesus Lord you took morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you to shame into glory you're the only one who can you took morning beauty for ashes, you to shame into glory, you're the only one who can, you to great into goodness, you to bold into army, you to seize into highways, you're the
mighty Jesus. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Somebody say, thank God for anointed musicians. Amen. God is so good to us. And uh, let me just say this at the outset of this service. Um, this is not a production. We are not here to be fake. We are not here to perform. We are here to create an environment where God and humanity can connect and have a real transformative experience. Uh, this world doesn't need more movies or more wannabe Christianity. Uh, we need an environment where God can be real, people can be real, and God can do whatever He wants. Amen? And so I thank God for musicians that serve the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to jump right into this today. Genesis 3.17, and uh, next Sunday is our Super Sunday. You do not want to miss. You want to make plans to be here, make plans to bring somebody with you, as well as make plans to stay and eat with us. Uh, you do not want to miss, I believe, uh, I could be wrong, but they said it's going to be Indian tacos, and uh, in our society that is not allowed to label anything with anything race, in this church they're called Indian tacos, and the Indian tacos is what they are and what they will always be, amen, and uh, that's just the way it is, and as you can tell, we have a male and a female bathroom because that's the way God made us, and I just want to throw that out there so that you know what this church is about. We're going to stand with God, not with anybody else, amen. amen. All right, Genesis 3.17. Let's jump right into this today. If you have your Bibles, the Bible says, And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Everybody say voice. Oh, it's going to get good. And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. I want to zoom in. I want to magnify this point in verse 17. Because, everybody say because, you listen to the voice of your wife. The wives in here are going, oh, Lord Jesus, what is he going to preach today? And the husbands are thinking like, that's right, Pastor. That's right, Pastor. You preach this thing. But because you hearkened to the voice of your wife. For the next few moments, I want to preach on this subject, discerning voices. Discerning voices. This subject is extremely important, so I just ask for your attention for a few minutes as God delivers this. Would you pray with me that God speaks Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We are humbled to be in your presence. We're humbled that you love us enough to speak the truth to us. Today, God, I pray that it's not the voice of a man that everyone hears today, but it is the voice of God speaking through a man. Speak clearly, God. Speak to every heart, to every mind. Open us, God, to hear you today. Help us obey you, Jesus. I pray for revelation and understanding and wisdom that comes from this text. I pray your will is accomplished in this service, God, because only you can perform these things. We pray this in your matchless name, Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated in Jesus' name. It was an ordinary day on the 29th of July, 1976. A woman by the name of Donna was walking around New York City, minding her business, living her life, enjoying her day, when out of nowhere, a man walked up to her, pulled out a weapon, and murdered her in broad daylight without any reason or any remorse. At the same exact time that this was happening, there was across the Atlantic an equally famous serial killer. His name was David Berkowitz. Uh, the Yorkshire Reaper viciously attacked uh, Peter. There's another guy named Peter Sutcliffe, and this guy was known as the Yorkshire Reaper. And he would viciously attack women and murder them time and time again. 
This has happened at the same time in history in 1976. But while this is going on, these, the manhunt begins and they go out to try to find these two murderers. Even more importantly than this is they're trying to find out what unites these two demented, demon-possessed... Well, I'm just throwing my spin out there. That's what I would say if I heard about this. What is going on in these guys' mind? When these two men were caught and they were interrogated, both of them claimed that a voice told them to do what they did. Hallelujah. You see, hearing voices is a phenomenon that is commonly attributed to both serial killers and to sudden one-off murderers. These people proclaim that the voice tells them to do things and that the reason that these people listen is because they are convinced that what they are doing is right. They are convinced that what they are fixing to do, even though it goes against logic, common sense, and emotion, that what they are doing is for the greater good. Amen. Amen. Today, I have been sent here to help you learn how to discern voices. Because there are voices in this world that are trying to convince us to do things that may not cause, maybe, maybe there's a voice in your life not trying to get you to go and pull a gun out on somebody and kill them, but maybe there's a voice in your life trying to get you to do something that will destroy your family. And my job is to help you discern that voice. Amen? Let us examine the first example of this. In fact, if you spend any time studying the book of Genesis, it's a, the whole theme of Genesis is voices. And the voice of the Lord came in the garden. The theme is, in Genesis 3, is learning whose voice is whose and what these voices say. Amen. Here in Genesis 3 and 17, I want you to pay attention closely. And to Adam he said... In other words, the very first revelation that God wants humanity to know is that because He made you in His image and He made you in His likeness, God has given you the capacity to hear His voice. God has given you the capacity to hear God speak into your life. But God comes to Adam and He says, Adam... Because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Can I tell you here today that it is possible to hear God but not listen? You see, there's a lot of people that hear from God. But on your hand, you can count those that listen to God. You see, Nimrod was gathering everyone into the Tower of Babel. The world was listening to Nimrod. But there was only one Abraham that was willing to listen to God. Because we can all hear God, but that doesn't mean we all listen to God. And God comes to Adam and he says, Adam, what is going on here? This is interesting. He's saying, Adam, you can hear me, but you don't listen. And I know you don't listen because you didn't listen to my voice. You listened to the voice of your wife. Amen. Adam, not only listen. Now, for a woman right here, this point right here, this is going to make you happy. At, to, to, to Eve, Adam was the perfect husband because he not only heard, he listened. <laughs> Take out the trash. You got it, babe. Can you please, please put the toilet seat down? Yes, sweetheart. This guy, he was the ideal husband for Eve, but he was not the ideal man that God made. See, some of you ladies, you better thank God when your man stands up to you because sometimes what he's doing is he's, he's, he's getting in alignment with being the head of the house the way he was designed to be. Well, that's all right. You don't got to clap for that. I'll preach it anyways. 
And here you got you got this issue where God is saying, hey, you 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 heard me, but you didn't listen. But you heard Eve and you listened to her. What is God trying to teach Adam? He's trying to tell Adam, Adam, I'm not sure you recognize what you did. I'm not sure you recognize that you're out of alignment. I'm not sure you recognize that you're out of my will. I'm not sure you recognize that the messenger you saw wasn't your wife. I'm fixing to preach here in a second. Hallelujah. In fact, God says, in fact, Adam, how could you not discern that what your wife was saying to you came from another source. How could you not pick it up? She told you to do the opposite of what I told you, and you told her what I told you. Where did this other message come from, Eve? Somebody say, help us, Lord. Look at this. Here's my question. Can you imagine poor Adam? He's looked at his beautiful wife and his wife's saying, baby, eat. And he's going, see, this is why I don't like vegetables right there. <laughs> baby, eat. It's good for you. No, it ain't. Yes, it is, kids. Listen to your parents. <laughs> hey, can I tell you, where did this come from? Because she was speaking. Adam was looking at his wife but wasn't discerning whose message she was speaking. See, your wife may be talking to you. Your friend may be talking to you. Your mom-in-law may be talking to you. Your uncle may be talking to you. And you may see flesh and blood that resembles that family member. But could it be that they're not the ones talking, they're just repeating what they've been whispered? Where did this message come from? Genesis 3 and 1, please. Look at this. The Bible says, Now the serpent, verse number 1, please. Now the serpent was more, right, you say crafty. He was a crafty man. Serpent, spirit, whatever you want to call him. Now this verse has always baffled me. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any, than any other beast of the field the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, why didn't the serpent go to the man? Could it be that he knew if he went to Adam and said, hey, I can't believe God told you not to eat of that tree. Could it be that Adam was going to be smart enough to say, what are you talking about, bro? Look at everything God's given me. Look at my wife God's given me. Look at, my God, I'm blessed. But no, but, but he's crafty. He's wise. This is why the Bible says be wise as a serpent. He, he was looking for a way to get Adam out of alignment. So he knew, I know how to do that. I just got to go and speak to him, not directly. I got to speak to him indirectly. I got to send someone he loves. I got to send someone he respects. I got to send someone he talks to. I got to send someone he can't live without. And I got to send that vehicle as my messenger. And so the serpent knows that he has to be crafty to get to Adam because Adam is made in the image of God and he's in alignment with God up to this point. And, but I want you to notice this. He looks at the woman and, he, and this is what he looks at the woman and says and he goes, did God actually say? Oh, that's so good right there. Oh, I wish to God that we would understand what he's, what's going on here. Did God actually say you got to be baptized in Jesus' name? Did God actually say you got to repent of your sins? Did God actually say you can't do that? Did God actually say you can't go there? Did God actually say you can't think that way? Did God actually say you got to forgive? Did God, oh yeah, God actually said it. And the serpent comes and he looks at the woman and he goes, did God actually say that? And you're thinking right now, you see, we don't understand what's going on. The serpent hasn't changed. His messengers have. 
This is why you'll walk into a church and you'll tell him, I just came out of a church service, Cornerstone North, and they just told me that I had to repent and get baptized in Jesus' name because Peter said so in Acts 2.38. And the pastor will look at you and he'll say, no, he didn't actually say that. You actually don't have to do that. It actually doesn't matter. And you think, surely it's a man of God. He has a suit and a tie on. You know what? There's a lot of crooked people that look holy. So what do you do? You judge the message. You don't judge the messenger. You judge the message. What are you saying? Is it in alignment with God? Is it in the word of God? Is it written by God? Is it inspired by God? Can you show me that it's God? And, and look what he says. Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, of any tree in the garden? He, 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 he opens the horizons. Look at verse number four real quick. I want you to see this. This is mind-bending. But the serpent said to the woman... Um, I, listen, if you come from another church, if you're visiting here, if you come from other pastors, I am not calling him a serpent. The serpent is calling him a serpent. How do we know that the serpent is not of God? It's telling, Adam, it's telling Eve what God didn't say. How do we know? How should Adam have been able to discern? How should Eve have been able to discern that this spirit was not of God? Well, God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. The serpent comes and says, you will not surely die. Well... Jesus said, except a man is born again of water and spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. It, unless you're baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sin, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. And people, will, you'll go to a life center or a real life or all these weird churches that the pastor does not have the fear of God to be able to tell you if God said it, then we got to do it. If it's written, we got to obey it. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be a man sent from God, not another serpent. Serpents tell you it doesn't matter. Serpents tell you it's not going to happen to you. Serpents tell you it's not essential. Serpents tell you you can do whatever you want. Serpents tell you to trust your feelings. Serpents tell you, well, serpents go to your door, knock on your door, give you another book and tell you to pray about it. That's what serpents do. Because they're carrying a different message. The message is absolute in conflict with God. In fact, the message is calling God a liar. When you sit down, when you tell me that you're going to heaven without obeying the word of God, you are telling me God is a liar. Well, hallelujah. That's what you're saying. You're, you're saying God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't act like that. God, God said it. Well, pastor, I just don't think he meant it. Well, look at this. Look at verse 5. This blows me away. For God knows, not only does a serpent tell you, Number one, not only does a, ter a serpent tell you, did God actually say that? Is it actually in the Bible? Another thing that a serpent does is a serpent tells you God is lying. The consequences are never going to arrive at your doorstep. But the third thing the serpent does is the serpent tells you, for the God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent turns you against God. The serpent tells you God is trying to hold things back from you. You go to a church. Man, I just came from this church, this Cornerstone North, and that guy's just preaching out so straight. And you know we live in a world that doesn't know what straight looks like. So my God, I, I, I don't want to go to a church that preaches it so straight. I, in fact, I think the pastor may be straight too.
You don't got to do any of that stuff. You don't got to do any of that stuff. That church is just trying to hold you back. That, that church is trying to hold down your individuality. That church is, that, that church is trying to control you. That, that church is trying to tell you what to do. Hey, could it be, could it be, that, that could it be, hallelujah, that I ain't trying to control nobody. I'm just trying to stay in the garden. Could it be that I'm just trying to go to heaven? Could it be that I'm just trying to stay safe? Could it be that I just want to stay with God forever? We'd be acting like, I feel held back. No, could it be that I'm holding you up? Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, but hey, can I convince you of this? Can I help you understand what God comes and does? He comes to Adam and he tells Adam, bro, do you even know what you did? Go to verse 18. I want you to see this. I want you to read this with your own eyes. What the Bible says, the Bible says in verse 18 that God tells Adam, hey, let me tell you what you did because you listened to the wrong voice. He said, thorns and, and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Has anybody ever worked in a field before? Has, any, has anyone ever been cut by a thorn before? Oh, I used to hate jumping on things and be like falling on them and be like, ah. You understand what the Bible's saying? God is saying, Adam, you don't realize what you just put in your life. You don't realize I gave you a thornless life, and now your life is filled with thorns. I gave you a life where you can walk over to the tree and grab whatever you wanted to eat. Now you're going to walk and think you're okay. And all of a sudden you're going to cut yourself and realize you're bleeding. And all of a sudden you're going to need time to heal from that bleeding. And all of us, see, we don't understand when God created a world where we could not cut ourselves and we did not bleed and there was no infection and we did not die. And God looks at Adam and says, because you listened to the wrong voice. Now you, hey, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? If, if you don't think this is important, I want you to go buy yourself a bunch of thorns. And, and, and I want you to just go ahead and lay them all around your house. Go to sleep. Keep all the lights off. And wake up and try to get to the restroom with no socks on. And, and, and as you're walking and it's hurting and you're bleeding, and it, ah, ah, that's what you're doing to your own life when you do not listen to God. God said, I'm not hurting you. You're hurting yourself. Oh, you're not hearing me. Some people be blaming God for everything going on in their life. And God's going, I didn't do this to you. These are the thorns of your decisions. These are the consequences of listening to people that you should never have listened to. Yeah, I'm going to go talk to my, I'm going to go talk to my sec, my, my two time over divorce uh, brother. And, and he's going to give me advice on how to keep my marriage in order. Oh, there's thorns on the way. You start listening to people that have no business talking because their life is filled with thorns too. You know what's going to happen? They're just going to pass on the bug, baby. And this, is what, this is what the Lord is saying. You're going to have to eat some of the plants of the field. Look at the next verse, verse 19. Look at this. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, uh, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Time out. Do you see what God did here? Are you catching what God did here? Just pretend you're seeing it be like this. Amen. I'm seeing it. Okay. Brother, Brother Gray, I, I want you to toggle for them, okay? Go to verse 4. Okay? And then after they read it, we go to verse 19. Verse 4, the serpent says in verse 4, You shall not die. That's verse 4. You're not going to die. Verse 19, God says, you will die. You see, God could not have spared Adam even if he wanted to. Because then God would make himself a liar. And he would make Satan a speaker of truth. 
So even though God did not want Adam to die, he had to let Adam die because I am God and I do not lie and I do not change. And if I said, you're going to die, you're going to die. I'm telling you, this is so important because it's two conflicting messages being preached. And here is the most common misconception that I have to try to pastor. When Eve stretched her hand out and touched, and she didn't die, if I can touch it and it doesn't kill me, maybe if I eat it, it won't kill me either. And you know what, God, yeah, you know what, God showed up and God yelled at us, but I'm still alive. And look, I'm having kids now. I'm alive. And look, it's been 100 years and I haven't died. And look, it's been 500 years and I haven't died. And look, it's been 700 years. I ain't dying. I ain't going nowhere. What God said isn't going to happen to me. And because God is so wise that he didn't want us to sit around here and think about like, well, maybe God won't do it. Oh, I'm going to show you that God did do it. Go to verse 5 of chapter 5, please. I want them to read this with their own eyes. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And God said, oh, I don't want to close this book until you know his fate. I don't want to close Genesis until you understand that I said it. And it doesn't matter if it takes 930 years. Homeboy died. Homeboy breathed his last breath. If I said it, it will come to pass. Hey, quit looking at 930 years of, of that. Like, oh, look, God gave him permission for 900. No, God gave him grace for 930 years. God gave him mercy for 930 years. God was long suffering for 930 years. But at the end of it, God said, you still got to die. He said, you ain't hearing me. I'll tell you why you ain't hearing me. Because the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And we read that and we think, well, how is it hard, pastor? They backslid and they got a raise. They backslid, they got a better job. They backslid and their house is in order. They backslid and they seem healthy. They backslid and everything's going well. Oh, that's what he thought too. That's what Adam thought too. Adam thought everything's going okay. I'm still alive. I still feel good. I'm still flexible. I'm still moldable. I still got food. I can still work. I still got, uh, everything's going okay. But God said, yeah, for now. Can I convince you? I'm trying to help you today. If the Bible says something, could you please take it serious? If the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard, can you please take it serious and not test God? If the Bible says that the backslider in heart is filled with his own ways, could you believe the scripture and realize that the reason you're going back to the way you used to be is because God is fulfilling his scripture and he's taking away the Holy Ghost from you and he's filling you with his own, with your own ways. David understood this in Psalm 51. This is why he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't, don't stop influencing me, God. You think, I feel good. I feel great. I'm not living for God, but I still feel good. It's because Scripture's being fulfilled. God is honoring his verses when he said, you're filled with your own ways. Hey, I'm more concerned when I feel good about doing bad. That's when I get concerned. When I feel good about doing bad, I get concerned because I'm thinking, could it be that God is filling me with my own ways? Hey, I don't want to live there, and I don't want you to live there either. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Pastor, how is this relevant? Well, not only is discerning God's voice essential, discerning the voice of the serpent is essential because of the consequences that you have to live. Hey, I don't think Eve was evil. Even though there's like a ring to it, Eve evil. I don't think she was malicious either, brother. I don't think she knew what she was advising Adam. I don't think she understood 
that her advice was terrible because it was outside of God's word. And so what's happening is you see this beautiful person, Eve, come to her husband and say, come on, let's do this. And Adam says, okay, I'll do it. And he has no idea that he's just unleashed everything we're living today. He had no idea. Death, murder, violence, leukemia, brokenheartedness, sorrow, all of the mess we see around us is a consequence of listening to the wrong voice. And can I tell you, you've got to be careful that you're not telling people what the serpent wants to tell them. Because if Eve was susceptible in her purity to carry the message for the serpent, what makes us exempt if we have no discernment? You can be telling some. See, this is why, Brother Miguel, this is why pastors that don't preach the truth, they do, like, I, I want to drop kick them like WWE. Because when they tell some, when, when I give someone a Bible study and I show them all of the evidence, all the historical evidence, all the biblical evidence that shows the essentiality of God's principles, and then they go to their pastor who they trust, and they say, Pastor, so-and-so said this, and the pastor looks at them and says, don't worry about it, it's not essential, it's not for us anymore. Please help me find a verse that says it's not for us anymore. In fact, there is no conclusion to the book of Acts. That means that if Luke would have kept on writing, every other instance of baptism would have happened in Jesus' name because every, every instance in there happened in Jesus' name. So if Acts ever concluded, if there was ever a closing to the book of Acts, then we would say the only way to baptize is in Jesus' name. And even if you keep it open, then you say the next baptism is going to be in Jesus' name because the last four were. You go to pastors that tell you and see they think they too they went to a baptist seminary but they don't realize you've been going to a serpent seminary you went to a pentecostal so that's a serpent seminary any seminary that does not tell you fear the word of god obey the word of god honor the word of god repeat the word of god speak the word of god any seminary that does not force you to offend mankind in order to please god is a serpent I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I know why I'm preaching to you. I know because there's some of you guys, some of you women that you're talking to people that are giving you advice and none of what they're saying is rooted in anything that God would tell you. They're telling you things that the serpent wants you to hear. Those voices are literally trying to convince you to literally pass down pain and sorrow and suffering and sickness into your family tree, into your genealogy, into your kids. They want to convince you to destroy yourself because they don't realize that they too are an offspring of the serpent. And God is saying, I, that's not why I designed you. I didn't design you to, to have to, to suffer the consequences for living for the wrong voices. You know what's terrible about bad advice? You have to suffer the consequences. You know, there's all these disclaimers now because people are being sued right now on Facebook. If you join stock groups, there's a disclaimer. This is by no means financial advice. You cannot hold it against me. I am not a professional, so please do not sue me. You know why? Because if you bet 10000 and you lose 10000 the guy that told you to bet on that stock does not have to pay your 10000 Well, pastor, what does that even mean? When that pastor tells you it's not essential and you stand before God and he tells you it was essential, God's not going to charge the pastor. He's going to charge you. People, oh, you're a little extreme. Am I extreme or am I normal? I can, listen, I, I, I wish to God we can all get teleported to John the Baptist's life. John the Baptist knew how to preach it. The Bible says he came to make the path straight. That's exactly what he did. Pastor, what are you trying to accomplish? I'm trying to get you. If I ever tell you something 
that I cannot give you biblical principle or precedent for. I'm asking you to please run. Why? Because your soul is more valuable than offending me. Your soul has an eternity, and I would rather you offend me and go to heaven than stick around and go to hell. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost wants you to know that when God says it, it doesn't matter how long it takes, it's going to happen. John 10, please. I'm almost done, I promise. Why is discerning voices so biblical, so important, so essential for all of us? Because a lot of us right now, believe it or not, we have the scars of the thorns that we've lived because of listening to the wrong people. And God is saying, hey, I didn't, I didn't tell you that. They did, and I'm trying to correct you before it's too late. Because I would hate for you to find out at the end of this that you were wrong. Look at this. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus has given us the story of the good shepherd. Next verse. What the Bible says in the next verse here. To him the gatekeeper opens. Here, okay, here you go. You ready? We're going to put our thinking caps on, and we're going to try to squeeze out the lemon juice out of this. Lemon juice, because I like them both. What causes the gatekeeper to open? The right voice. You see, I, my mind is closed off to voices that don't represent God. I'm responsible for what I allow into my eyes, my ears, my heart, my spirit. I'm the gatekeeper of my soul, and so I get to choose who I open it to. And a lot of us live with an open gate, so things come and go as they want. But see, a wise person closes those gates and only opens it to the voice of the shepherd. Hey, can I tell you, I've been pastoring long enough, Brother Miguel, and this, I, this irritates me. God, look, I, look, I got the Moses issue. I got anger issues, okay? And the older I get, I get even crankier. And I'm only 33, so imagine me in seven years. I'm going to be real cranky. You know what ticks me off, brother? Is that people will close their gate to the man of God that's bringing the word of God, but they'll open their gate to everybody else. Somebody can tell you a bunch of dumb stuff, and you're like, that's, yeah, 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 that's so good. Oh, my gosh, we're like, we're like this. The man, the man of God will come and say, hey, that's an infection. That's bad for you. That's going to destroy you. And I, and I can hear those gates just closing. And what scares me about that, Brother Matt, is you're not just keeping the voice of God out. You're keeping all the thorns in. You're going to have to pay for what you keep inside of yourself. And the Bible says to him, the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. What is the Bible trying to teach us here? When you open the gate to God of your life, and you really let God speak into your life. You've given him access to develop a relationship with you so that he names you. Nobody names a pet they're not going to keep. And if you do and you kill it, you're a savage. And I'll give you props if you eat it. Oh, this is Scruffy, man. He's real good. <laughs> Thank God for Scruffy. Hey, folks, you can't go out into a crowd, a crowd of people that you don't know, and you don't know any of their names. But see, that's what modern Christianity is like. 
Modern Christianity is so messed up that if you put Jesus in a crowd, they would have no idea his voice sounds like. If there was five voices talking, they'd be like, dude, I don't know who to, I don't know who to listen to. Pastor Joe, Pastor Jeff, Pastor this, Pastor that. And God's like, none of them! Because we're so used to just being casual. Hey, you know what's amazing about voices? You have to literally, God created us with the ability to know the difference between voices. He designed us so that the little boy you're raising up, when he hears the voice of daddy or mommy, he knows the voice of daddy or mommy. There could be a crowd of men yelling and that boy will recognize his dad's voice because of the relationship. Not only that, but the relationship causes you by name and he leads them out. Out of what? Out of this jacked up world. That's where. And next verse. Give it to them, Brother John. When he has brought out all his own, everybody say own. How were they brought out? A voice. A voice. Got them out. And if that voice is bringing you out, that's because God is claiming you as his. Hey, listen, I'm fixing to offend people, and that's okay, because you need to hear us. I was standing in at the one church in the valley. I was a, back, I was a backslidden heathen devil. I was just there to mess around with, this, with the pastor's daughter because I figured she messes around with everybody, so all the musicians. And so I'm just, I'm like this, this I, I was agnostic. So I'm thinking like, if God is real and he allows this, <laughs> then he's not mad at me because I'm at least being honest with who I am. And, and I'm, I'm at this church and, and they're preaching this fuddy-duddy stuff and passing the offering plate every two seconds for money. And, 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 and I'm like, man, this is a joke. And I'm in this church, and the voice of God says to get out. And I'm trying to figure out why. They got the lights, the show, the programs. They got all this stuff. It's cool. It makes me feel good. They got great Christian musicians. Probably not living right, but it is what it is. And, and I'm thinking like, man, I, I, I want to make this my home church. My uncle comes back from deployment. And I bring him to the service. And my uncle was a backslidden heathen. And I bring him to this one church service. He walks into that church service. It's about 15 minutes in. And he looks at him and he goes, you ready to go? And I'm thinking like, no, I want you to stay for the whole service. He looks at him and he goes, let me take you somewhere that preaches what the Bible actually says. And I thought to myself, is this God speaking to me? Or is this just my uncle? My uncle said, just trust me. That was the greatest decision I ever made, was to come out of that environment and realize God has more in his word for me than a bunch of Humpty Dumpty stuff. Pastor, what are you trying to teach us here today is that if God, if you attend a church that does not preach the Bible, it does not preach the whole Bible, and is not willing to stand for what the scripture actually says, can I tell you the reason you're listening to this message right now is because there's a voice calling for There's a voice calling, saying, is that really what you want for yourself? Do you really want to gamble with your soul? Do you really want to live with uncertainty? I mean, can you really explain away all the verses that this man is telling you? Or could it be that the vocal cords that you see are not human, but God is speaking to you? Look what the Bible says. He goes before them. All of us want God to follow us. God wants you to follow him. Somebody called me and told me, they said, I just really feel like God led me to this church. And I said, he did. He led you there so that you can continue to move forward. Because God will take you through places to show you how messed up his name has been abused. And then he moves you on to the next thing. God knows what he's doing, folks. He goes before us. And the sheep, everybody say sheep, follow him. Why do they follow him? For they know his voice. I'm just really mad at that pastor. I can't stand the way he says things. Could it be that it's the voice of God that you're mad at? 
could it be that like Adam could not see that Eve was carrying the message from the serpent that you cannot tell that I'm just carrying the message that comes from God? Could it be like John the Baptist that got his head cut off because he was carrying a message that wasn't even his own? He was offending people by telling God, by telling everybody the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepares the way of the Lord. He was preaching Isaiah's sermon and Elijah's spirit and he was giving them repentance and they killed him because they did not like his voice. And this is why when Herod chopped off, I'm preaching right here. This is why when Herod chopped off the voice, and I, this is a scary place to be. When, when Herod chopped off the voice of John the Baptist, the trailblazer, this is why Jesus would not speak a word to him. When you chop off of the voice of a man of God, God says, I'm not talking to you either. You think that's true? Study the book of Acts. God did not tell Cornelius how to be saved. He told Peter to tell Cornelius. God did not tell Paul how to be saved. He sent Paul to a man to tell him what God said. Amen. When you chop off the head of a man of God that represents the truth, God says, you're never going to hear from me again. Oh. Hey, that's some scary stuff right there, folks. But they follow him for they know his voice. Next verse. I'm almost done and wrapping up here soon. I promise. Next verse, here we go. Everybody say a stranger. What do you tell your kids? You get mad at your pastor because he's telling you that those, the strange things you're believing are bad. You're getting mad at the pastor because he's telling you that you don't even know where the stuff that you're saying comes from. You're getting mad at the pastor because he's telling you don't do this, but you don't even know that the person that came up with that is the serpent and he's using strange mediums to get you. You're getting mad at the pastor because he's telling you stranger danger. He's yelling out, don't talk to strangers. Don't listen to strangers. Don't live with strangers. Don't love strangers. But I'm telling you, the Bible says a stranger they will not follow. You know what? This society is conditioned to follow anybody. This is why Facebook, look at your Facebook. You got people following you and you're following people you don't even know. Because you've been conditioned to follow anybody. You've been conditioned to listen to anything or anyone. And can I help you understand what's going on here today that God is saying, hey, quit listening to strangers. Don't listen to them. In fact, don't follow them. Some of y'all need to go home and start unfollowing people. Some of y'all need to start clearing your Facebook and Instagrams and your little tiki twocks or whatever they're called. No, I'm preaching to you right now. You know why? Because it's the stuff you follow that's getting you to follow it through. Look what the Bible says. They will not follow. They will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. You know what's scary? It's scary when you know the voice of strangers more than the voice of the shepherd. Could it be that today you're sitting here and you're following strange doctrines, strange ideologies, strange beliefs, and God is trying to crack into you and say, do not follow strangers. Somebody say, help us, Lord. I close with this. Give us some anesthesia. Please keep it at two milligrams if possible. I heard this beautiful story that touched my heart that I wanted to share with you about voices. I showed you the negative, right? Voices that cause you to hurt others, hurt yourself, destroy your life, destroy everything connected to you. I want to talk to you about God's voice. September 11, Ron was another ordinary day. He went to the second tower to go work at his story. The first plane hit the first tower. His wife, 
being a good wife, called him and said, Sweetheart, Tower One has been hit. Did you feel it? Ron said, I did. She said, you need to get out. Ron said, Sweetheart, it's, it's only the tower next to us. We, we're fine. She hung up. A few minutes pass. Everyone going back to work. They're telling everybody, just go back to work. Not a big deal. Wife calls him again and says, Ron, I just really feel like you got to get out of there. And Ron said, sweetheart, I can't. The managers came up and they told us all to go back to our seats. Ron hangs up with his wife. And then a voice speaks to Ron. And you know what he says? Get out. Little did Ron know that his wife was at home praying her heart out. Praying, God, please speak to my husband. God, please save my husband. God, please get him out of, out of danger. And she's praying for Ron. And a voice comes and speaks to Ron and says, get out. He can't figure out what that voice is coming from. And so Ron, even though he knows he can get in trouble, he looks at his buddy and he says, we got to go. He grabs his friend and he said, let's go. About four seconds after he walks out of that, that floor, a second plane comes and hits his, his office space. If Ron would have listened to the voice, he would have instantly died. But now Ron is still stuck in the, he's stuck in the staircase. There's fire blocking down. Everything up is locked. They're stuck. It looks like fate has given them to burn alive. Ron's trying to get his group of people that came out with him. Hey, let's try this. It doesn't work. Let's try this door. It doesn't work. And, and because of the fumes and the heat that's coming into that stair, stairwell, his friends are beginning to faint. And they start falling one by one. And then Ron begins to accept his fate. And he's thinking, to himself, he's thinking to himself, I should have just died instantly. Now I'm just suffocating here. And so he sits himself down by the staircase. And he's, dizzy, he's dozing in and out of what's going on, consciousness. And the voice comes to him again and says, walk towards the fire. And Ron is thinking, okay, I'm hallucinating. But the voice says, walk towards the fire. All of his friends have fainted. They're all passed out. Nobody's left but him. Ron has nothing to lose now. You know, the voice that he trusted saved him the first time. So Ron used his brain and said, if this voice is right again, I'm going to be okay. So Ron forced himself up and begins to walk towards those stairs. And all Ron sees is fire the voice says a third time walk through the fire and Ron's like Ron's not a dumb guy he knows these fumes are rocket fuel this is going to incinerate me but he knows this is not me talking because I ain't crazy enough to do this so he takes his suit jacket off and he puts it over himself Ron doesn't know if the fire is a whole flight down, the whole way down. Ron doesn't know anything. All he knows is that a voice told him to walk through the fire. Ron puts his jacket on and he begins to walk towards the fire in faith. And before he knows it, what was keeping him lost was two stairs with fire. Just two stairs with fire were keeping him from being saved. He looked at the stairs in disbelief and walked his way down those flight of stairs and survived and was reconciled with his family. Pastor, what can we learn from Ron? Is that sometimes the voice of God will ask you to do things that you may think are impossible, but they are to man, but they're not to God. Well, pastor, do you have chapter and verse for God protecting someone from fire? Yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go through the fire. They stayed in the fire. And so when God spoke to this man and had him do something that goes against his nature, it actually saved his soul. Pastor, what are you preaching? You've got to learn to discern voices. Because some voices will destroy you and other voices will save you. And you've got to learn to discern them. Judge them on the merit of the message, not the messenger. It's not about if I look like a preacher or not. It's not if I sound like a preacher or not. It's about, is this the truth? Would you stand with me today? This is what we want to pray for, okay? Hey, listen, God sent me here because he loves you. And he sees the thorns that you're having to go through. And he sees your life. He sees the pain and the suffering. God sees the struggles. God sees the tears. God sees how you bleed at night and you have no idea how to fix it. God knows the people that are speaking into your life that are giving you bad advice that are just causing you to live with pain. I'm telling you, this message is not an indictment of you as a bad person. This message is God saying, I love you. Learn to hear my voice. Learn to know that I'm talking to you. Learn to hear and to listen. Trust me, I want the best for you. I didn't design you to die. I designed you to live forever. I didn't design you to experience sickness. I designed you perfect in the garden. My will for you is the best. But there's another voice in this world, and it's the voice of the serpent. And the serpent has many vocal cords. He'll speak to you through celebrities. He'll speak to you through musicians. He'll speak through you through idols and idolatry. He'll speak to you through education. He will speak through you through any vehicle that he thinks you'll open your gates and allow into. See, God loves you more than you realize. And he wants to help you today. Amen. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word today. First and foremost, God, forgive me for listening to everybody but you. Lord, I have this really bad habit of listening to the people that I can see, not listening to the one that I cannot see. Lord, forgive me for listening to people that have caused me tears and pain and years of suffering and heartache. God, please forgive me for not trusting you, but trusting the advice of people that don't even know you. God, I'm asking you for forgiveness because I know that it hurts you to see me suffer for the things that I do when you did not design me for this. You did not create me to suffer. You did not create me to go through these things. Most of the stuff, if not all of the stuff that I'm going through right now, God, is a result of the voices that I've allowed into my life. And God, I've come here today. You've spoken to me today. I pray that I can discern that you're speaking to me, God. I pray I can discern that you're trying to give me direction right now, that you're trying to change my course right now. God, I pray that you would help me open my heart. In fact, God, I'm going to open my heart right now. I'm going to open my mind to what you just told me, and I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to pray on this. I'm going to do my best to apply it to my life because I genuinely do not want to live the rest of my life going from thorn to thorn instead of from faith to faith, God. You did not design me, Jesus, for failure. You designed me for spiritual success. And God, I am sick and tired of speaking or, or, or being spoken to by voices that don't know what they're talking about. And God, can you please help me have a little bit of a higher standard for the people that talk to me and give me advice? Uh, come on, Lord. I can do better than that. I, it, I, I can't go to broken people and ask them how to be healed. I got to go to people that have been healed. I, I, I got to raise up my standard, Jesus, so that I stop giving the serpent access into my life. Come on, somebody. Right now, God is asking you to to close some doors in your life. He's asking you to close some doors in your life because the serpent
servant knows how to get to you. He knows how to talk to you. He knows exactly how to get a response out of you, a reaction out of you. And God has sent me here to tell you, it's time that you close that gate to the serpent and that you open the gate to God. It, 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 it's, it's time that you stop living in thorns and you start living within the blessings and the callings of God because he did not design you to do this this way. I'm telling you, I'm preaching to you right now. God loves you. You do not have to go home from this service the same way. You don't have to return to the mundane. You don't have to go home and just think that it's just life and it's never going to change. God has sent me to tell you that it can change. But you've got to learn to listen to these voices. You've got to learn to listen to the voice of God that is calling you right now and is calling you by name. The scripture says it's not his will that any perish, but that all come to repentance. This is a great opportunity to change the course of your life. Change the course of your destiny. Come on, reconcile yourself to the God that loves you more than anyone else. Come on, do what's best for yourself today and your family and your friends. Come on, if not you, who? If not now, when are you going to give yourself over to the voice of God? Come on, you need the voice of God in your life because it's always right. God's voice is always right. It's never wrong. Even when he gives you counsel that you don't like, it's always right. It's never wrong. God knows. He doesn't think. He knows. God knows everything. And we've got to yield to that voice today. Come on, there's, there, there's people here under the sound of my voice that God has been knocking on your door for weeks, for days, for months. He's been trying to get your attention. But you have so many voices in your life that have been distracting you. And God is saying, can you discern my voice? Can you hear me in this service? Can you recognize that I'm preaching to you? Can you hear that I'm talking to you right now? Okay, come on, can you believe that I know what you're going through? Come on, can you believe that a guy that does not know you has just preached to you exactly what you're going through? Yes, God is speaking to you today. Come on, somebody. Come on, this is your opportunity. Come on, let's, let, let's get some thorns out of our life. Let's get some things out of our spirit. Let's close some doors to some access for those serpents. And let's open up our hearts to God. Let's become his sheep. Let's become his people. Let's learn his voice. Let's take upon his name. God, I want you. I don't want a stranger. Hallelujah. And I don't want to be at risk of believing in a strange Jesus. Oh, I'm preaching right now. Come on, somebody. Maybe you came in right now and you believe in a strange Jesus that lets you do whatever you want, live however you want, and never directs you. No, 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 no. That's a strange Jesus. The real Jesus came to pay the price for your sins on the cross, but he didn't come pay the price so that you can continue in sin that grace may abound. No, he came to help you overcome it. He came to deliver you from it. He came to break the chains that have held your family and your friends and your genealogy captive. Come on, somebody, get a hold of the real Jesus today. The Jesus that loves you, the Jesus that believes in you, the Jesus that died for you, and the Jesus that wants the best for you, the Jesus that will correct you, the Jesus that will speak to you, the Jesus that's not afraid to offend you, the Jesus that's here for you, that Jesus is available to you today. His word was just preached to you in this service, and you can either fall in love with the real Jesus or go home to a stranger. You can either fall in love with Jesus or live the rest of your life with what could have been the what ifs, the what happens if I would have listened. Oh God, help us today. Help us today, Jesus. Help us today, Jesus. Oh, I want the best. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on. This is just alignment. Hey. Do me a favor. Could you lay your hand on the person next to you? Come on. Can you lay your hand on the person next to you if it's appropriate? And, and I want you to pray for them. God, help them hear your voice. 
Come on, pray for them because you don't know. You don't know what their ears have heard. In fact, I want you to pray healing on people's ears right now. There's people here that their ears are hurt because of the cussing and the crude stuff they've heard, the assaults. Come on, there's people here that all you've heard your whole life is you're dumb, you're not good enough, you're nothing, you're useless. Can I, come on, let's pray for healing right now that God heals the ears of the person next to you so that they can hear the loving voice of their God. God and Savior, so that they can hear the voice of the encourager. They can hear the voice of the God that died for them. Come on, the devil's a liar. The serpent's been lying to you. The serpent told you you're useless, but God said you're not. The serpent told you you deserve death. Jesus came to give you life. The serpent wants you to settle for anything, but God wants to give you the best. Come on, you, you need to start believing the voice of the shepherd and stop believing the voice of the serpent. I refuse to listen to the serpent. In fact, I pray right now by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ that you silence the voice of the adversary, that you silence the voice of that roaring lion, that you silence that voice of that nasty dragon, that filthy serpent from Genesis, Father. I pray that you silence him, that you cast him out of minds, cast him out of homes, that God, we take authority right now over the serpent. You said that the Messiah would triumph over the serpent, and he did, and I am an offspring of him. He is the first of many. I am a Christian God. The serpent has no authority in my life. The serpent has no power in my life. The serpent does not have a voice in my life. I'm shut off to the voice of the serpent because I believe in the voice of the shepherd. I don't listen to the voice of the serpent. I listen to the voice of the shepherd. If the shepherd says it, I believe it. If the shepherd says it, I live it. If the shepherd says it, I pursue it because I'm here to serve and follow and love the shepherd, the good shepherd, the saving shepherd, the blessed shepherd. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, in my mind's eye, I can see the voice of the serpent beginning to diminish in your brain right now. Oh, come on, I can see it in my mind's eye. I'm prophesying to you right now that if you will start listening to the voice of the shepherd, then the voice of the serpent is not going to get louder. It's going to start to fade, and you're not longer going to hear it. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost has sent me to tell you if you will get yourself in alignment with the shepherd, then the serpent's going to be nowhere to be found. There's a reason we have a shepherd. The shepherd protects us from serpents. And I believe that the shepherd, the good shepherd, that laid down his life for me is in this service right now and he's here for you he's here to protect you he's here to break those chains he's here to silence those voices he's here to tell you you can do it he's here to tell you you can make it he's here to tell you you can rise from the ashes even though that the thorns of life have hit you that God is good at removing thorns that God is good at teaching you how to live with them sometimes that God is the only one that can do this in your life because he's the good shepherd and he laid down his life for the sheep he laid down his life for us he didn't die so we can die he died so we can live he didn't pay the price so that we can suffer in the lake of fire he paid the price so that we can go back to the garden forever because all he cares about is can you please hear my voice can you follow me can you follow me instead of strangers? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, yes, God. God, make my ear in tune with your voice. Teach my mind to recognize your spirit. Help me, God. Help me, Jesus. Only you can do this. Father, I pray that you bless your precious people. Bless everyone that was able to hear this message. I pray, Father, that in this service we make a commitment to not just pray and not just hear, but I pray that we listen, that we become sheep and we listen that we become good sons and daughters and we listen. Because at the end of the day, 
Lead the way, Father, and I'll follow. Because there's no life and there is nobody else I'd rather follow but you. You are amazing, Jesus. We thank you for what we feel right now. We thank you for your presence in this service. We thank you for helping us hear your voice through the preaching of your word. I pray that you help this be embedded in our spirits and that we are reminded of this when the serpent comes trying to speak lies into our life. Remind us to discern the voice by what it is saying and allow the word of God to prevail. We pray this today, Jesus, by the authority of your mighty name. Somebody said amen. amen. Hey, real quick, Sister Crystal has a prayer. She wants us to pray for her. Can you